It's Monday, January 9th, 2023. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, a cave art discovery that could put the development of writing back thousands of years. Plus, one U.S. state taking concrete steps against misinformation. And Benoit Blanc isn't just playing among us. Now, he's in it. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. A discovery by an amateur archaeologist might have just pushed back the birth of writing by about 10,000 years, depending on your definition of writing. Much of the earliest writing was practical, not creative. You know, lists of livestock and inventories, things like that. And generally, it's accepted that the earliest writing systems emerged around three to 4,000 years ago, mostly in Mesopotamia to begin with. What's sometimes called proto-writing, that is, symbols and markers used to represent items or concepts, goes back a few thousand years earlier, still snugly within the Neolithic era, however, which began about 10,000 years ago. But from the Paleolithic era in Europe, we have hundreds of cave paintings. Now, many of these are of various animals, you know, bison, fish, wild horses, extinct types of cattle. So these date back to about 15,000 to 40,000 years ago, back when humans were still hunter-gatherers. But the cave paintings don't just depict animals. Some of them are decorated with short series of dots and lines, a handful of them together in a row, often four, sometimes as many as 13, and sometimes there's a Y shape beside the animals as well. For decades, archaeologists have been uncertain about the true meaning of these markings, and they couldn't just be artistic detail like blood or breath, because why then would they appear in all different locations on the animals in an inconsistent manner on each species represented as they are? Perhaps they were keeping track of how many of each type of animal was killed or sighted within that community. That could make sense. But furniture conservator Ben Bacon had another idea. What if the dots and dashes were a type of calendar tracking the life cycles and breeding patterns of the animals? That would promote the markings to a whole new level of cognitive ability in our Paleolithic ancestors. Now, a bit about Ben Bacon, because people are having a field day reporting that some ordinary dude may have made such a huge discovery. While Bacon, or his peers, it's unclear, described himself as effectively a person off the street, and some articles have framed his discovery as him just casually looking at some cave art and having an idea, one article about the discovery in the BBC gives him a bit more credit. Bacon told the outlet that the markings in cave art have always intrigued him, and that he utilized resources at the British Library and online to pursue what he calls a similar approach that others have used to understand an early form of Greek text. And after amassing as much data as possible and starting to identify some patterns, he reached out to friends and senior university academics, who he then partnered with at their suggestion, to analyze his hypothesis and get the work published in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal. So Bacon may only have a bachelor's degree in English, but he didn't exactly just stumble into this discovery after looking at some cave art in a museum. In any case, here's what Bacon and his co-authors settled on. The markings used lunar months to note migratory and mating patterns of the animals depicted. As their paper states, quote, It seems to us unnecessary to need to convey information about the numbers of individual animals, the times they've been sighted, or the number of successful kills of these. It seems far more likely that information pertinent to predicting their migratory movements and periods of aggregation, i.e. mating and birthing, when they are predictably located in some number and relatively vulnerable, would be of greatest importance for survival. We hypothesize that such numerical information should record information about the timing of these events in the annual round, end quote. They add to their hypothesis that there are never more than 13 lines or dots, and there are 13 lunar months. And that Y shape I mentioned could be indicative of breeding, either because it shows two parting legs, as in giving birth, or because it shows two becoming one. 
Quoting Vice, To test out this hypothesis, the team compiled a database of more than 600 line and dot sequences without the Y symbol, as well as some 250 sequences with the Y, which appear mostly in paintings from France and Spain. These sequences span tens of thousands of years and accompany many different animal depictions, such as aurochs, birds, bison, caprids, such as goats and antelopes, deer, fish, horses, mammoths, and extinct rhinos that once lived lived in Europe. After conducting a statistical analysis of the database, Bacon and his colleagues were amazed to find that their lunar calendar seems to hold up well with the patterns. And the researchers add, our data do not explain everything, but even taking imprecision and regional variability into account, the degree of support for our hypothesis is striking. End quote. Now this is all very intriguing, but is it writing? The researchers know that would be a bold claim, so they stopped short of outright saying that and wrote in the conclusion of the paper, quote, In a general sense, writing can express quantity and or commodities, as it was used to compare the numbers associated with animals rather than the animals themselves. It seems that in the Upper Paleolithic system, numbers represent discrete quantity, abstract values that could be manipulated independently of the animals that they are associated with. One common definition of writing is that it is written language, i.e. not only acts as a notational system, but one which has a connection to the phonetic form of the language spoken by the writer. We may not be convinced that the Upper Paleolithic sequences and associated symbols can be described as written language, given that they do not represent grammatical syntax, but they certainly functioned in the same way as protocuneiform. We do not want to press the controversial, and in many senses, semantic question of whether writing was a Paleolithic invention. Perhaps it's best described as a proto-writing system, an intermediary step between a simpler notation slash convention and full-blown writing." End quote. But even as a proto-writing system, these cave art dots would predate previously identified proto-writing systems by many thousands of years. And when you get into the nuts and bolts of the semantics and consider the various interpretations of these dots and lines in concert with the animal drawings, there is actually a pretty decent argument that they are slightly more than proto-writing. The authors write as an example, quote, In our reading, the European Upper Paleolithic system functioned to record a subject and information about the behavior of that subject expressed in relation to natural events. It therefore expressed far more than the tablets recording numbers of commodities from Uruk period Mesopotamia, end quote. Now, regardless of if we define this as a proto-writing system or not, its implications on the abilities of Ice Age hunter-gatherers is what's particularly intriguing to me. Co-author Robert Kentridge, a Durham University professor who helped develop the field of visual paleopsychology, told the BBC, quote, the implications are that Ice Age hunter-gatherers didn't simply live in the present, but recorded memories of the time when past events had occurred, and used these to anticipate when similar events would occur in the future, an ability that memory researchers call mental time travel." End quote. And his colleague and fellow co-author Paul Pettit said, quote, The results show that Ice Age hunter-gatherers were the first to use a systematic calendar and marks to record information about major ecological events within that calendar. End quote. And Bacon points out to Vice that it would mean that they were fully modern humans, almost as cognitively advanced as we are now. And if these findings hold up, we could use them to learn a lot more about their lives and cultural values. In an episode about the birth of writing, literature and history podcast host Doug Metzger says, quote, Seeing the world through the perspectives of past cultures and nations makes us realize that our own outlook is neither neutral nor the product of some inevitable forward evolution, but instead just a small node in an unfolding story. While literature can lift us out of our own time and invite us to question even our most basic cultural assumptions, literature also teaches us that much of the core stuff of human experience is similar over the churn of generations. In this sense, literature makes us feel less alone in the cosmos, and more part of a synchronous family of sisters and brothers, all in it together, thick and thin. 
Ultimately, then, reading literature can be a search for difference and a search for familiarity, a reminder that we should never take our cultural perspective for granted, and at the same time, a reminder that we have all breathed the same air, drank the same water, and done variations of the same things over the course of 5,000 years of recorded history and 250,000 years of our species' existence prior to that. End quote. A few dots on cave drawings, consistent as they may be across hundreds of drawings across the European continent, may not be literature, but to the extent that they represented anything, they are a reminder of exactly what Metzger said there. A reminder that for tens of thousands of years, we humans have had largely the same priorities, that of survival and of love. And sometimes being reminded of that can help you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. It's a common refrain, at least here in the United States, that we learn so many things in school that most of us will never use again, like pre-cal or the War of the Roses. And yet, we're never taught topics we could really use, like personal finance or, in many states, sex ed, nutrition, even civics is barely taught in useful ways in a lot of schools these days. Now, particularly as someone with a liberal arts degree, I will definitely argue for curriculums that include pre-cal and the War of the Roses or what have you, because I think there is a lot to be learned in simply learning, in critical thinking skills, in developing self-discipline, in getting a little taste of all sorts of different topics to help you pick what might be valuable to you in the future, or at least help you have a better understanding of the work and expertise of others if you end up in a fairly siloed field. But we do also need to add in some of that other stuff in our schools. Unfortunately, at least one U.S. state has just passed a bill mandating that students from kindergarten through 12th grade be taught one topic that is absolutely crucial in this day and age. Information literacy. The first state in the nation to introduce such a requirement, New Jersey will now require students to learn about, quoting Politico, how information is produced and spread on the internet, critical thinking skills, the difference between facts and opinions, and the ethics of creating and sharing information, both online and in print, end quote. The bill passed with overwhelming bipartisan support and was signed into law by Governor Phil Murphy last week. And quoting again from Politico, Education advocacy groups, librarians, and media specialists have backed the bill for years, but the effort found new prominence in the wake of remote learning due to the COVID-19 school closures and the increasingly powerful hold conspiracy theories like Stop the Steal and QAnon have had on the Republican Party. Librarians in particular have pushed state lawmakers to act on the bill as they've seen their jobs sacrificed due to budget cuts in recent years. End quote. And as one sponsor of the bill, Assemblymember Mila Jassy, pointed out, kids today have a previously unimaginable amount of information available to them, and is therefore more important than ever that they're taught how to engage with that information, how to suss out bias, and understand it in context. Personally, I am also glad to see that the curriculum will include the ethical production of information. That's one thing I see many people unaware of these days, particularly in posting photos of people without their permission or amplifying unsighted claims. You know, we have to be sure that we're being both responsible consumers and producers of content, and anyone with any level of a public account is a producer, not just influencers and corporations. As New Jersey Education Association President Sean Spiller said in a statement, quote, At a time when misinformation and disinformation are eroding the foundations of that democracy, it is imperative that students have the tools they need to determine what information they can trust. This law will help ensure that New Jersey students are equipped to separate fact from fiction as they prepare for their role as citizens and future leaders. End quote. Fingers crossed that we will see more states follow suit so that we can pave the way for a more critically aware future society.
So in the newest installment of the Knives Out franchise, Glass Onion, there's a scene of several characters playing the popular mobile game Among Us. And I'm a bit late to this, but if you haven't logged into Among Us in a few weeks and have also missed it, Among Us itself collaborated with the movie so you can actually play as lead character Benoit Blanc. Or in Among Us parlance, there is a free Benoit Blanc cosmetic available, so you can dress your character up in Blanc's now legendary swimming costume from the latest movie. For a limited time, anyways. In fact, it ends tomorrow on the 10th, so apologies for the late notice, but I still think it's a pretty cool collaboration just to know about, seeing as the game itself is featured in the movie. I've only played Among Us once or twice, so I barely know what I'm talking about here, but what I do know is that Glass Onion was freaking great. Since watching it, I have gone back and watched both of the first two Kenneth Branagh Poirot movies and picked up an Agatha Christie novel. I just can't get enough of these eccentric detectives. But that's going to be it from me for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.